Welcome to those of you that are joining us virtually via Zoom or on the phone. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us this evening. We have worked to accommodate virtual participation and to provide interpretation for our time together tonight. If you are having any technical difficulties during this virtual session, please reach out to info at pfastcommunityengagement.org. I will now hand it over to Grace Martin at LRG, who will review the webinar platform for this evening's virtual community engagement session. Thank you, Kareem. Next slide, please. So first, a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded. All attendees are muted and in listen-only mode until the feedback portion of this session. During the second half of the session, we will open it up for feedback from individuals who have signed up ahead of time to speak. Then there will be an opportunity for others to share comments. We'll share specific instructions on how to give feedback using your device mic during that portion of the session. Next slide, please. Um, a quick overview of Zoom controls. You can adjust your audio and mic settings in the lower left corner of the Zoom navigation bar. You'll use the raise hand function if we have time at the end of the session for additional public feedback. Click show captions to turn on English closed captioning and you can select what language you want your audio in using the interpretation button. Next slide. Thank you. There is an English and Spanish audio stream available for this session. To access the translated stream, you must listen via online audio in Zoom, not via the call-in number. Click interpret the interpretation icon on the navigation bar in the lower part of the Zoom window to access your translation options. Select your preferred language, either English or Spanish. If you are listening in Spanish, it is recommended to mute original audio. This option is also located in the translation button. Next slide. And again, if you uh, need any technical assistance with the Zoom platform, please email info at pfastcommunityengagement.org. Next slide. And before we begin, I want to highlight that by participating in today's online event, you acknowledge and consent that your name, video, image, or phone number may be visible to others in the live online meeting, as well as captured in the recording. With that, I will turn it back over to Kareem. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us. Tonight, we are going to focus on a class of chemicals known as PFAS, and we'll use our time together to both describe the work the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is doing related to these chemicals, and then to hear from you. I will serve as your moderator for this evening's session, but before I begin, I would like to share a little bit about myself. My name is Corrine Lai, and I work for EPA Region 9 as manager of the drinking water section, responsible for oversight of drinking water matters in the Pacific Southwest. In this role, I work on national policies, direct regional resources, and provide technical assistance to assure the delivery of safe drinking water to communities. I have been there at the beginning when PFAS was first daylighted as a chemical of concern in drinking water, and I'm currently working with states, tribes, territories on the challenges posed by PFAS in both our drinking water and in our environment. I have likely worked with many of you and will continue to engage on this very important matter. As a moderator, it is my job to keep our session organized and moving along this evening. Thank you again for joining us. Next slide, please. I'd like to share our basic plan for our time together. And right now we are starting on housekeeping and introductions. Next, we will hear a few words from EPA's regional administrator, Martha Guzman, uh, we will then turn to a member of our EPA, EPA's PFAS Council, Jeff Dawson, before we hear from my colleague, Matt Small, 
who will share more about her and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, and also about EPA's work under the PFAS Strategic Roadmap. Following these remarks, we look forward to hearing from many of you during the listening session portion of tonight's event. We'll share more details about how you can participate in the listening session when we get to that portion of tonight's agenda. But next, I would like to introduce you to Martha Guzman, EPA's Regional Administrator for EPA Region 9. Thank you, Corrine, uh, and thank you so much for your tireless efforts on this uh, topic and all of the drinking water issues in our region. Uh, my name is Martha Guzman. I am the Regional Administrator for the EPA-specific Southwest region. As you can see on this slide, it talks about uh, the territories that we have within the region. We have not only the states of California, Nevada, Arizona, and Hawaii, but we also have uh, the Pacific territories, and we'll be talking about that today, as well as 148 federally recognized tribes. Uh, I really want to thank you for taking the time tonight to join us and um, to share your thoughts. It's very important to hear from you directly. I have um, some uh, background I want to share with you on the topic really around drinking water uh, and sustainable groundwater, as well as some of the more recent issues that I've been able to work on with some of the communities that have been most impacted. Uh, during my previous time in my career, I served um, under a California governor, Governor Jerry Brown, where I was part of passing the Human Right to Water, as well as the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And I just share that to share the importance I share with all of you about the importance of our drinking water and all of our groundwater supplies. Um, and more recently in this role, I've been able to uh, meet with communities throughout the region, including uh, heavily impacted communities like the city of Tucson in Arizona and many communities in California and Hawaii, um, as well as a recent trip uh, to the territories where uh, the, the community of Guam is also dealing with this. Uh, and I heard firsthand from all of them about their health their environmental and their economic impacts and the well being uh, concerns from their communities. While there are no uh, PFAS manufacturing facilities in our region, we have had our own challenges with PFAS contamination of these water sources. In 2016, following the required water system sampling for unregulated contaminants, our region had nearly 25% of the water systems nationwide that exceeded the EPA health advisory for PFOA and PFOAS, PFOS at the time. And at the time, it was seven parts per trillion, 70 parts per trillion, excuse me. Many of those systems either stopped using uh, the impacted sources uh, or they started to provide treatment. These included water systems, as I mentioned, in Arizona and California and the outer Pacific Islands, as I mentioned, Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands. Since then, PFAS investigative studies and monitoring have been conducted by states and utilities and have shown the presence of PFAS at levels of concern throughout the region. We're working with those impacted communities, as I said, um, and really, uh, there's different strategies that we'll talk about for both mitigation and treatment. You will hear this evening that EPA is working hard to find solutions to this critical issue, including, including today's action, which is to seek this public input and information on whether to include PFAS in its proposed rule to designate two PFASs as hazardous substances under our CERCLA regulation. And you'll hear more about that related to Superfund sites. As you know, uh, we are here not to talk tonight about a group of these chemicals called PFAS and the effort that EPA is considering or actively taking to address these chemicals. And then most importantly, we want to hear from all of you. My colleagues will share more about this in a few minutes, but PFAS are widely used. They're long lasting chemicals and are often called forever chemicals because they don't break down over time. And there are thousands of different PFAS constituents. 
Studies show that certain PFAS have, uh, can have serious public health and environmental impacts. And we continue to learn more about these chemicals, human health and environmental effects. EPA is working to address these chemicals using our PFAS strategic roadmap, our plan to research, to restrict, and to remediate them. Before we begin tonight, I want to acknowledge that these conversations can be challenging, partly because this, the issue we are about to discuss uh, can be complex, like many things, and partly because many of you here are already dealing with PFAS. It's already impacting you, your family, your community, while others are concerned about the impact that it may have in the future. Uh, we have almost 300 registered folks tonight representing communities throughout the Pacific Southwest region and probably from other regions uh, that have been impacted by PFAS. Many of these communities, as I mentioned, that I've, I've visited with um, and have learned tremendously about how they've adapted to these challenges. By partnering with others to research, to better understand, and to prevent PFAS exposure, uh, we hope to get to even greater strategies. One of the themes you will hear today is the importance of working across government, across EPA, with all of our partners, all of other federal agencies, all of the tribal nations, states, and most importantly, you, the public, to tackle this significant challenge. And a critical area of focus for us is to empower meaningful action on behalf of all people, impacted by these chemicals, regardless of their zip code or skin color. The core group at EPA working on PFAS is known as our EPA Council on PFAS. And Corrine mentioned the PFAS Council, that's, that's the team. And in a few minutes, you'll, I'll be turning over to my colleague, Jeff Dawson, a member of this uh, PFAS Council to share some of his opening thoughts with us. The feedback you provide tonight will help us better understand what you, your family, your community are experiencing to keep us focused on protecting human health and the environment and addressing PFAS contamination. And your feedback will help us better communicate the risk of PFAS, including information about being better about describing what PFAS are, their uses, and how they can impact our health. In our listening session later this evening, my EPA colleagues and I are interested in hearing from all of you about how PFAS has impacted you, your family, and your community. You'll soon hear from uh, my colleagues about the EPA actions, and I welcome, as I said, your feedback on additional actions or how we can improve upon these actions. We're working in close coordination with all of the folks I've mentioned across government and the public, and we want to welcome feedback on how to work more effectively with all of our partners. And finally, as I mentioned again, the importance of really understanding how PFAS contamination has had disproportionate impacts with communities, those communities that are already overburdened by environmental hazards and contaminations and what specific actions we could take or partner on to address those concerns. Thank you again for being here tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Dawson. Thank you, Martha. My name is Jeff Dawson. And I work at EPA headquarters as a chemical safety and pollution prevention. In this role, I help develop and implement approaches for evaluating new and existing industrial chemicals and pesticides. An additional responsibility I have in my job, and the reason I'm here with you today, is that I serve on the group Martha mentioned, which is known as EPA's PFAS Council. As Martha mentioned a few minutes ago, addressing PFAS issues is a top priority for EPA and our administrator, Michael Regan. And as you'll learn more in a moment, one of the administrators, Administrator Regan's first actions when he joined EPA in 2021 was to create EPA's PFAS Council. In creating the council, Administrator Regan asked us to develop an ambitious plan of action to advance science and research 
to restrict these dangerous chemicals from getting into the environment and to remediate the problem in communities across the country. The plan we developed is known as the PFAS Strategic Roadmap, our whole of agency approach to addressing PFAS. You'll hear more about the roadmap in a few minutes. The roadmap sets timelines by which EPA plans to take specific actions across each of our major program areas, not only in the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, but in other areas as well. And in addition to these program specific priority actions, we also included a set of actions that cut across our specific program areas. And one of these critical areas is engaging directly with communities. One of the key reasons we are holding this session today is due to a recommendation from EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council that we engage with communities in each EPA region. In my job in DC, I'm committed and passionate about moving EPA's work forward on PFAS, but tonight it's just as important that I learn that I join you all here in Region 9 so I can have the opportunity to hear firsthand about your experiences with PFAS contamination. By listening to all of you, I can have a better sense of how to have the greatest impact through our work. So thank you all for being here today. And I look forward to hearing from many of you during our listening session later this evening. Now I'd like to turn it to Region 9's lead point of contact on PFAS, Matt Small, to spend some time walking through EPA's PFAS strategic roadmap and setting the stage for our listening session. Thank you, Jeff. As Jeff indicated, my name is Matt Small. I work in EPA Region 9 as our Regional Science Liaison. In this role, I help to facilitate communication, collaboration, and technical support between Region 9 and EPA's Office of Research and Development. An additional responsibility of mine is to serve as our point of contact for Region 9 on PFAS issues and to work closely with the PFAS Council to ensure we are coordinating effectively on these issues. Tonight, I will share some information about the work EPA has done under the PFAS Strategic Roadmap, highlight actions that we are planning for the future, and listen as you all share your experiences with PFAS to inform our work in Region 9 and across the country. Next slide, please. As Jeff shared earlier in April 2021, EPA Administrator Michael Reagan established the EPA Council on PFAS and charged it to develop a bold, strategic, whole of EPA approach to protect public health and the environment from the impacts of PFAS. The Council, comprised of senior technical and policy leaders from across EPA program offices and regional offices, is co chaired by EPA's Assistant Administrator for Water, Radhika Fox and EPA's Regional Administrator for Region 1, New England, David Cash. The Council addressed Administrator Reagan's charge to address PFAS impacts through the PFAS Strategic Roadmap, released in October 2021. The roadmap does several things. It includes clear timelines for concrete actions between 2021 and 2024. It fills a critical gap in federal leadership, setting a common approach to federal PFAS protection across the country. It supports states' ongoing efforts to tackle PFAS by building critical science methods, tools, and technologies. And it builds on EPA's commitment to restore scientific integrity by making science the foundation of our work. I'll return to the specific commitments in our PFAS roadmap in a few minutes. Next slide, please. Before I share more about EPA's PFAS roadmap, I want to spend a few minutes talking about PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or as I will refer to them, or we've been referring to them, PFAS, and why we are concerned about these chemicals. PFAS captures a large group of synthetic chemicals made by humans that consist of chains of carbon atoms surrounded by fluorine atoms. There are thousands of different PFAS chemicals with a variety of chemical structures. Some of these PFAS chemicals have been more widely used and more widely studied than others. 
As examples, this slide shows the chemical structure two of two of the most widely used and studied chemicals in the PFAS group, known as PFOA and PFOS. PFAS have been used in homes, businesses, and industry since the 1940s. They have been and are used by many industries and found in many consumer products due to their useful properties, which include stain and water resistance and their beneficial role in firefighting foam used to extinguish fuel fires. Due to their widespread use, PFAS have been found in soil, water, fish, and air across the country and around the world. Surveys conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show that most people in the United States have been exposed to PFAS, including measurable levels of certain PFAS in human blood. Most known exposures to PFAS are relatively low, but some can be higher, particularly when people are exposed to a concentrated source over long periods of time. PFAS are a concern to human health due to their known or suspected toxicity. Their health effects are better known for some PFAS, such as PFOA and PFOS, but much less well known for some of the others. I'll describe a bit later some of the work EPA is doing to improve our scientific understanding. Finally, scientific research has shown that PFAS can restrict decomposition in the environment can, excuse me, can resist decomposition in the environment and in the human body due to their unique properties. Next slide, please. The life cycle diagram on the left of this slide shows some of the ways in which PFAS are used and can enter the environment. I know some of the text is very small and can be a little hard to read, but the picture helps to illustrate a few major ways PFAS can enter the environment and, and potentially impact human health. These ways include discharges of PFAS pollution from manufacturing facilities, discharge of PFAS containing firefighting foam, PFAS entering wastewater treatment facilities from upstream sources, and PFAS applied to agricultural fields as a component of biosolids. Biosolids are the solid organic matter left over from the wastewater treatment process. Through these significant and diverse pathways, PFAS contamination presents unique challenges. EPA's approach toward PFAS takes this uniqueness into account and is, and is centered around the following principles. First, consider the life of PFAS, including their unique properties, the ubiquity of their uses, and the multiple pathways for exposure. Second, EPA wants to get upstream of the problem. EPA is bringing deeper focus to preventing PFAS from entering the environment in the first place, a foundational step to reducing the exposure and potential risks of future PFAS con contamination. Third, EPA is holding polluters accountable for their actions and for PFAS remediation efforts. Fourth, Ensure science-based decision-making. EPA is investing in scientific research to fill gaps in understanding of PFAS. And fifth, prioritize protection of disadvantaged communities. When taking actions on PFAS, EPA, EPA is ensuring that disadvantaged communities have equitable access to solutions. And this principle of protecting communities is a critical reason why we are here tonight. Next slide, please. The risks posed by PFAS demand that EPA attack the PFAS problem on multiple fronts at the same time. The actions described in our strategic roadmap each represent important and meaningful steps to safeguard communities from PFAS contamination. And we believe these actions will build upon one another and lead to more enduring and protective solutions. EPA's integrated approach to PFAS is focused on three goals. The first goal, research. EPA is investing in research development and innovation to increase understanding of PFAS exposures and toxicities, human health and ecological effects, and actions we can take that incorporate the best available science. Second, restrict. 
EPA is pursuing a comprehensive approach to proactively prevent PFAS from entering air, land, and water at levels that can adversely impact human health and the environment. And third, remediate. EPA is broadening and accelerating the cleanup of PFAS contamination. Research, restrict, and remediate. In the PFAS roadmap, EPA committed to issuing a public report on its PFAS project each year. In November 2022, EPA released the first one-year progress report summarizing the critical actions we've taken. Since the roadmap's release in October 2021, EPA has taken the following actions, which I'll talk about in greater detail later in the presentation. We've proposed to designate two PFAS as hazardous substances under CERCLA or Superfund. We've released drinking water health advisories for four PFAS. We've laid the foundation for enhancing data on PFAS. We've begun distributing $10 billion in funding to address emerging contaminants under the bipartisan infrastructure law. We've expanded the scientific understanding of PFAS and translated this science into EPA's efforts. We've proactively used enforcement tools to better identify and address PFAS releases. And we've released a set of PFAS analytical tools to publicly share data on PFAS in communities. And finally, we've engaged with federal partners in the public. EPA's PFAS work was informed by public webinars, stakeholder meetings, congressional testimony, and engagement with EPA's federal advisory committees. EPA is also coordinating with its federal agency partners in the Biden-Harris administration to harness the collective knowledge experience and capacity of the federal government to address PFAS. In addition to highlighting the actions EPA has taken, our one-year progress report also identified a series of upcoming priority actions for 2023, such as proposing a national drinking water standard, which we announced in March, taking final action on the proposed CERCLA designation for PFOA and PFOS, continuing to improve chemical data and safety, restricting upstream PFAS discharges to waterways, addressing PFAS in biosolids, and engaging with communities like we're doing here tonight. I will cover each of these upcoming actions in a few moments. Next slide. Over the next few slides, I will cover some program-specific commitments from various offices here at EPA. As I highlighted earlier, science and research are the foundation of EPA's work on PFAS. EPA is working to improve the scientific understanding of PFAS in three primary areas. First, we are working to develop and validate methods to detect and measure PFAS in the environment. Second, we are working to advance the science to assess human health and environmental risks from PFAS. Our scientists are developing human health toxicity assessments for additional PFAS, compiling and summarizing available and relevant scientific information, identifying PFAS sources, the ways PFAS move in the environment, and the pathways by which people can be exposed to PFAS, and characterizing how PFAS exposure may contribute to cumulative impacts on communities. Third, we are working to evaluate and develop technologies for reducing PFAS in the environment. This work will inform decisions on drinking water and wastewater treatment, contaminated site cleanup and remediation, air emissions controls, and end of life materials management. Next slide, please. The next area I'll cover is our work to ensure chemical safety. EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention is working on many actions to restrict PFAS, and most of these actions fall under two laws, the Toxic Substances Control Act, or you may have heard this called TSCA, and the Toxic Release Inventory Program, which you might know as the TRI program. First of all, EPA is working to deepen our understanding of PFAS categories 
through the National PFAS testing strategy, which EPA released in October 2021. The testing strategy is a major step towards the game-changing goal of breaking PFAS into distinct categories to direct research, amplify regulatory action, and accelerate technology and policy solutions to restrict and remediate PFAS. Second, EPA is working under its TSCA authorities to strengthen EPA oversight over both new and existing PFAS. EPA is working to ensure a robust review process for new PFAS to ensure that chemicals are safe before they enter commerce. And we're working to review existing PFAS under TSCA to ensure they are being used in ways that do not present concerns and to prevent resumed production of legacy PFAS or their use in new ways. For example, in late January, EPA pro proposed a rule that would ensure that any discontinued use of certain PFAS cannot re-enter the marketplace without EPA review. Third, EPA is collecting data and improving reporting on how PFAS are used and released. Under TSCA, we are working on a final rule to better characterize the sources and quantities of manufactured PFAS in the United States. This final rule would collect significant new information on chemical quantities, byproducts, worker exposure, and disposal methods. Under the Toxic Release Inventory, or TRI, we are working to enhance PFAS reporting by proposing a rule to remove exemptions and exclusions from reporting. Last December, EPA released a proposed rule to enhance TRI PFAS reporting. If finalized, this rule would enhance the data available to the public, so EPA and other federal, tribal, state, and local agencies can use these data to help best protect health and the environment. And fourth, EPA is working to reduce the presence of PFAS in products purchased by the federal government. In December 2021, President Biden signed an executive order that will reestablish the federal government as a leader in sustainability. A critical element of the executive order is to promote sustainable federal purchasing, which includes prioritizing the purchase of products without added PFAS. EPA is taking a leadership role in this work. Next slide. Thank you. Next, we will cover our Office of Water where we are taking an extensive set of actions to restrict PFAS through EPA's programs to protect drinking water and our lakes, rivers, and streams. First, let's take a look at drinking water. On March 14th, EPA took a key step to protect public health by proposing the first ever national drinking water standard for six PFAS, fulfilling a foundational commitment in the PFAS strategic roadmap. Through this proposed rule, EPA is taking a major step to protect public health from PFAS pollution, leveraging the latest science and complementing state efforts to limit PFAS by proposing to establish legally enforceable levels for six PFAS known to occur in drinking water. The rule is currently open for public comment until May 30th. Uh, and you can learn more about what the proposed rule learn more about the proposed rule and about how to access how to access the formal public comment docket on our website www.epa.gov slash pfas again that's epa.gov slash pfas epa recently held two webinars on the proposed rule and EPA recently made the webinar recordings and presentation materials available on our website. And we will be holding a virtual public hearing on the proposed rule on May 4th. You can learn more about these opportunities, again, at epa.gov PFAS. EPA is also working to improve drinking water data through monitoring, toxicity assessments, and health advisories. EPA is currently taking important steps to monitor drinking water in communities across the country through our fifth Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, or UCMR-5. 
This program is testing for 29 PFAS chemicals from 2023 to 2025 in thousands of drinking water systems nationwide. You may remember that an earlier round of EPA monitoring from 2013 to 2015 helped us discover PFAS contamination and led to significant state and local safeguards of our drinking water. Excuse me, I needed a little drink there. With our latest rule, we are taking it a step further. We'll be testing for nearly five times more PFAS chemicals at significantly more water systems and using methods that can detect PFAS at much lower levels. These new data will be critical in improving our understanding of how communities, including low income communities and communities of color may be exposed to PFAS in their drinking water. As I mentioned earlier in June, 2022, EPA released four health advisories, interim health advisories for PFOA and PFOS, and final health advisories for PFBS and for Gen X chemicals. Under the Clean Water Act, EPA is working to develop national technology-based discharge limits for industries that use PFAS through our Effluent Limitations Guidelines Program. In January 2023, EPA released its final Effluent Limitation Guidelines, Plan 15, which outlines key steps toward addressing PFAS discharges across a range of industrial categories. Also, under the Clean Water Act, we're working to address PFAS in permitting and through analytical methods, water quality criteria, and fish advisories. We are working to leverage the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, wastewater permitting program to improve monitoring and to reduce PFAS discharges to waterways. In December 2022, EPA released new guide guidance to states describing how to leverage permits and pretreatment programs to increase monitoring, including at known or suspected dischargers of PFAS. This guidance will enable states to take appropriate steps to restrict PFAS at their sources, collect important data on PFAS discharges, and enable communities to work closely with their state permitting authorities to take action where discharges may occur. We're also working on improved analytical methods to measure more PFAS in more places. In April 2022, EPA released draft aquatic life water quality criteria for public comment for PFOA and PFOS, which reflect the latest peer-reviewed scientific knowledge regarding the effects of these chemicals on freshwater aquatic organisms. We are also working to enhance data availability on PFAS in fish tissue to help states and tribes to set PFAS fish advisories. And finally, I referenced earlier, we're working to evaluate the risks of PFAS in biosolids. We will be finalizing a risk assessment for PFOA and PFOS that will serve as the basis for determining whether regulation of these two chemicals in biosolids is appropriate. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide covers two of our program offices, our Office of Land and Emergency Management, which houses EPA's cleanup programs, and our Office of Air and Radiation, where our team of experts work to address air pollution. First, we will talk about a specific action that I highlighted earlier under CERCLA, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act or more commonly known as Superfund. In September, 2022, EPA published a proposed rule to designate PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under CERCLA or Superfund. If finalized, this rule would require facilities across the country to report PFOA and PFOS releases that meet or exceed the reportable quantity for these substances would also require 
that they enhance the ability it would also enhance the ability of federal tribal nations state and local authorities to obtain information regarding the location and extent of releases enhance the ability of epa and other agencies to respond to release or threats of releases of pfoa and pfos and help establish national consistency in the evaluation and cleanup of PFOA and PFOS and encourage better waste management practices. As identified in the roadmap, EPA intends to take final action on the proposed rule in 2023 and will continue to work closely with stakeholders to better understand equity concerns. And as an additional step, today EPA published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register that seeks public comment on potentially designating other PFAS chemicals as circular hazardous substances. Next, under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, EPA plans to propose two regulations in 2023. First, EPA plans to develop a proposed rule to add specific PFAS to the list of hazardous constituents, which would mean these PFAS are subject to RECRA corrective action requirements. Second, EPA plans to clarify that emerging contaminants such as PFAS can be cleaned up through the RECRA corrective action process. The third item on this slide highlights EPA's commitment to take significant steps toward updating our research and guidance on PFAS destruction and disposal. EPA published interim guidance in December 2020 in that document, we highlighted significant uncertainties about the effectiveness of some PFAS destruction and disposal technologies. We have a deadline to update the guidance by December 2023. Finally, our Office of Air and Radiation is also taking steps toward restricting PFAS by building the technical foundation for potential Clean Air Act regulation. We are working to identify sources to develop monitoring approaches and information on mitigation technologies and to increase our understanding of the fate and transport of PFAS air emissions. This work will support future decisions on whether to designate PFAS as hazardous air pollutants under the Clean Air Act. Next slide, please. No conversation about PFAS is complete without highlighting the transformational investments being made in America's water infrastructure through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or BIL, signed by President Biden in November 2021. The BIL provides the single largest investment in clean water that the federal government has ever made. The BIL will build on research restrictions and remediation called for in the PFAS roadmap by providing $10 billion for communities impacted by PFAS and other emerging contaminants. <clears throat> the BIL builds on three of EPA's existing water finance programs, but focuses them specifically on PFAS and emerging contaminants. And it provides $10 billion of these funds without a requirement for state, ma state matching funds. And all funds are provided either as grants or principal forgiveness loans. Of the 10 billion, 4 billion will flow through the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, 1 billion will flow through the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, and 5 billion will provide grants to address emerging contaminants in small and disadvantaged communities. In February 2023, EPA announced the availability of $2 billion from this program to address emerging contaminants, including PFAS and drinking water across the country. These funds will be allocated to states and territories and will promote access to safe and clean water in small rural and disadvantaged communities while supporting local economies. EPA is committed to maximizing the impact of these funds in addressing urgent water challenges facing communities. And we are thrilled that these funds will enable communities to invest in PFAS treatment solutions. While EPA continues to take action to research, restrict, and remediate PFAS consistent with our PFAS strategic, strategic roadmap. I've covered a lot of information in this presentation tonight and would encourage you to visit our website 
Again, that's epa.gov slash PFAS, where you can find all of this information and much more on what actions EPA has taken and plans to take on PFAS. The website is regularly updated and will have the latest information related to new rulemaking and other actions. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to our moderator, Corrine, to talk more about the next part of our session where we will hear from you. Thank you, Matt. In a few moments, we look forward to hearing from you, those of you that are interested in providing feedback to EPA. But before we do, I first wanted to provide you with some background. I want to emphasize that the feedback you are sharing with us tonight will help inform future actions EPA takes towards helping communities address PFAS contamination. One important thing to note is that the feedback you share with us will not be considered as part of the formal comment process for any specific action EPA is taking consistent with the EPA's PFAS strategic roadmap. If you have comments on any specific action that we are taking, such as a proposed regulation, you should provide those comments as part of the formal public comment process. And you can learn more about those actions we have taken at our website at www.epa.gov slash PFAS. Again, epa.gov slash PFAS. Some of you may be wondering what EPA plans to do with the feedback that you are sharing with us this evening. We do not plan to individually respond to the comments re we receive. However, we do plan to take back everything we hear from you tonight, as well as the feedback that we have gathered at the other regional listening sessions that we are holding, including the session that we held for tribes on April 6, to inform EPA's future work on PFAS. Now I would like to turn it over to Grace at LRG to share some additional details about how our listening session will work. Thank you, Corrine. We will now be opening the session up for public feedback. First, we'll hear from individuals who signed up during the registration process. Before we get to those folks, a couple of tips on how to share verbal feedback. If you signed up ahead of time, you'll receive a message in Zoom with a link that gives you speaking permission. Please click on that message. When you have speaker permissions, we'll call your name. At that point, you should unmute and begin speaking. You are welcome to turn your video on or keep it off. Please limit your comment to three minutes. And I also want to mention that if you have trouble clicking on the message in Zoom or unmuting yourself, you can email us at info at pfascommunityengagement.org and we can help you resolve your issue. And even if we're unable to help you and we, we get through all of those speakers that signed up ahead of time, um, we expect that there will have time uh, for everyone else who is on this, this webinar um, to give a comment if they'd like to at the um, towards the end of the session. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to our moderator and uh, please, uh, be patient with us. Occasionally, it'll take a little bit of time for us to have um, get our, our speakers ready uh, for public comment. So we appreciate your patience with that. I see Jill Buck. If you could click yes. on the top, please go ahead and speak. Thank you so much. Are you able to hear me? We are. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the roadmap so very much. I live in a community where our drinking water is badly contaminated with a variety of PFAS chemicals. Recently, I worked with Eurofins, which is a great lab out of Sacramento to get my blood and my water tested. And there were some surprises um, 
I, I did have some high levels with some of the um, chemicals in both my water and my blood. And so I strongly support two aspects of what was briefed earlier on the research side and science-based decision-making. And I think that what really will be helpful is to make testing more available to communities where their drinking water has been as badly impacted as my community and many others. And I know that for some families, getting those kinds of tests can be very cost prohibitive. And so if there could be grant programs or if there could be opportunities for communities to um, you know, have some assistance in helping people get testing done, I think that would be very helpful. I'm particularly concerned about children. Um, I, I think you know, if, if parents know where their children's blood levels lie in terms of PFAS exposure, they can make some really important decisions, both with their pediatrician about certain uh, testing that needs to be done, and also um, about, you know, limiting their exposure um, in, in ways that maybe they hadn't considered before they saw uh, their children's uh, uh, serum levels. And so I strongly support uh, the research, the science-based decision-making, and would just ask for robust investment in testing for individuals, particularly in a place like Pleasanton, California, like where I live, where our drinking water is, is badly contaminated. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your feedback. Um, Linda Shoshi. All right. Hello, my name is Linda Shosi. I am. I live in Tucson, Arizona. I am the owner and founder of the Environmental Justice Task Force, and I'm going to share a little story, just a little bit about my personal experience with PFAS in my community. I'm going to start with for too long. For too long, the military and aer aeronautic industries have been dumping toxic chemicals uh, into Tucson Southside public water system and poisoning our land. A 24 square mile area on Tucson Southside was designated a Superfund site when the EPA found TCE in drinking water in 1980s, but the EPA never cleaned it up, cleaned up that contamination. Later, the EPA detected PFAS in our area as well. <clears throat> when our community group demanded more testing, you know, we all know about PFAS. We all know what PFAS are. Um, thousands of people in the Southside community have been forced to drink, bathe, cook in that contaminated water without even knowing what their limits are because no one has even bothered to test their water, test their blood. And I agree, there has to be a robust uh, investments to provide these communities, disadvantaged, low-income, EJ, Black, Brown, BIPOCs, all these understudied communities, which Latinos have been under, understudied uh, when it comes to PFAS. There's been a lot of studies here and, and uh, that's very, very unfortunate. But yeah, we do need that and uh, again, and children especially, by them knowing, their parents knowing, <clears throat> they can teach and learn how to, to reduce exposures and the health disparities in their homes. I personally lost my daughter uh, to cancer, what I believe is caused by the contamination. Our community has been on Superfund since 1980s, so I hope that this, you know, I'm really, I, I really am really overwhelmed with all this that the EPA is doing. I thank you guys so much, um, you know, and, and I really want to see something happen in these communities, not just mine, but all over the world that are, are being left behind and from these investments. Thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Soshi. Appreciate your feedback. Um, Andrea Ventura. Yes, hi, hello. My name is Andrea Ventura, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the organization I work for, Clean Water Action here in California. But I do want to start out by saying that 
I live in a suburban community in San Jose, California that had high levels of PFOS in our water. We drank it for years. We have the advantage of having the well taken offline. But so many of our communities in California do not have that option. And, the, and they're like deer in the headlights facing what regulation is going to mean in terms of cost. So yes, we need the polluters to pay. And those are the people that sold us PFAS down you know, over the decades. Um, so I want to back up a little bit. And it gets to a little bit of what, what the previous speaker said about people knowing where they're, um, they're being exposed. And I think that one of the problems we have had working on this issue, and I've worked on this issue for a good five, six years now, is we kind of skirt around the discussion of PFAS. We talk about looking at the toxicity levels and looking at different kinds of PFAS. And the bottom line is we cannot do that. These are a class of chemicals, all of which are persistent in the environment. And if we look at the toxicity of specific PFAS and overstress that, we are forgetting that also many of these smaller alternatives to PFOA and PFOS turn into the well-known toxic chemicals once they're in the environment. They transform into those chemicals. So, you know, EPA does recognize, if you look at the website, it does recognize when it says how many PFAS are um, thought to be um, in, uh, in production or exist, um, they do take in the whole class of PFAS, but there is a lot of confusion in different departments of EPA using different definitions of what a PFAS is. 18 states, including this one, define a PFAS um, as a class of fluorinated chemicals with one uh, fully fluorinated carbon, and we really need to look at them from that perspective, because what's going to be happening, some of the things you're doing are fantastic. I'm glad to see what you're doing in water, uh, in drinking water regulations. We see that you're trying to look at more than just those two chemicals and figure out how to do that. But at the end of the day, you, you regulate PFOA and you regulate PFOS, and what's going to happen is people are going to think their water is safe and they're still going to have smaller chain or newer PFAS. Um, two more points and I'll end. Uh, I know time is of the essence. We also have to protect ourselves from regrettable substitutions um, by bringing in new PFAS. Right now, we're getting a lot of push from the aerosol industry wanting to use HFOs, which we consider a PFAS. Um, for various reasons saying that these are the answers to HFCs. Um, you know what, that's like putting mercury in a light bulb. You create you know, energy efficiency and then you have water pollution with mercury. That is a regrettable substitution. We need to do what Europe's doing. We need to ban these chemicals, period, across the board. There may be some essential safety reasons, but we cannot trade one environmental problem for the other. And the last thing I want to say is I'm proud of uh, what EPA is doing on drinking water. I'm proud that California has been doing a study on drinking water, though we're very slow. But And we have done a lot to ban sources of PFAS. But the focus has been on drinking water. That makes sense to me. That was the place to start. But we are not seeing our water boards embracing PFAS as something they have to consider in surface waters like San Francisco Bay which has some of the highest levels of PFOS in wildlife in the world. And the concern there is an environmental justice one because we do have unknown, because they're kind of off the grid, subsistence fishing going on in the Bay for both cultural reasons and for economic reasons. And so we would love EPA to kind of nudge our regional boards um, in California that oversee our surface waters and saying, what are you doing about adding PFAS to your 303D list issues? You know, what? How are you looking at this? Um, how are you going to determine whether this is going to affect fishability of these waters? Because it does have an environmental justice impact that can be very dangerous to people. With that, I'll shut up and leave it to the next speaker. But I appreciate the opportunity and and to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ventura. 
All right, uh, Eric Oriana with um, Community Water Center. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Oriana. I'm a senior policy advocate with Community Water Center, uh, and I'm here with members of the AWA coalition, uh, a coalition representing more than 30 communities fighting for safe and clean drinking water in California Central Valley and Central Coast. Uh, we're here in strong support of the proposed regulation for 6 PFAS chemicals. Um, various community members in the AWA coalition are served by water systems impacted by PFAS contamination or uh, systems that have not been tested for uh, PFAS because uh, they rely on small water systems or private domestic wells. I want to urge the agency today to adopt the proposed regulation, continue regulating other PFAS chemicals, hold responsible corporations accountable for putting profits above people, uh, and provide water systems across the country with the adequate support to treat for PFAS chemicals. I also urge the EPA to include a plan to support residents relying on domestic wells to address PFAS contamination. Uh, in closing, I want to urge the agency to hold more outreach sessions uh, to meaningfully engage uh, with communities as it seems like there's a lot of appetite for this type of work moving forward. Uh, finally, I just want to echo a lot of the comments that uh, Ms. Sandra Ventura shared and um, really aligned with a lot of what she said. Uh, and I want to clarify if uh, we want to turn back to the, the couple other community partners who are going to be sharing comments, or uh, should I pass it on to them? Um, if you could pass it on. Oh, we have a Martha Curio, Curio with CWC. Yeah, Curio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Ah, yo vengo de la comunidad de Woodville. Ah municipio de Tular en California y pues mi agua también estaba muy contaminada ya ahorita la están tratando uh, y esperemos que pues que mejore más con el tiempo eh, mi pueblo es una comunidad muy pequeña y habemos gente trabajadora ahí trabajamos el campo Y, y esperemos que con la maquinaria que le están poniendo ahorita están tratando el agua y la están limpiando de nitrato. Gracias, señora. Uh, Sandra. Thank you. Hola. Um, I, I believe we now have a Sandra Garcia with CWC. Oh, okay. Hola, mi nombre es Sandra Garcia. Yo soy una de las fundadoras del Centro Comunitario por el Agua y soy miembro de, de la mesa directiva del Centro Comunitario por el Agua. Y también tenemos mi pueblo, es un pueblo agrícola que somos ya puros trabajadores del fin. Y ahorita pues ya estamos viejos, ya no podemos uh, tener la posibilidad de estar comprando botellitas de agua. Y ahorita con, se nos inundó la mitad del pueblo y tenemos miedo que este contaminante pifas se nos meta ahí en, en nuestra agua. Estamos um, preocupados. Y más porque tenemos pues ahorita mis nietos, todos los nietos de todas nuestras familias, los niños y nosotros de grandes que ya no, no tenemos tanto dinero para estar pagando tanta agua, entonces ya de por sí tenemos nitratos, entonces um, ahorita estamos preocupados por este nuevo contaminante porque como se metió tanta agua en nuestro pueblo, entonces sí estamos preocupados por esta posibilidad de que se nos uh, infecte nuestra agua, aparte de todos los contaminantes que ya tenemos. Y pues ojalá que nos puedan ayudar, no nomás a mi pueblo que es Papler, pero también tenemos varias comunidades chiquitas que necesitan ayuda sobre este contaminante y que mucha gente no está informado, entonces necesitamos ayuda también para este de informar a las comunidades de este nuevo contaminante. Gracias. 
Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Um, I believe next we have Orlanda Arismendi. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Irlanda Arismendi. Yo vivo en la comunidad de Baixelia, California. Y nosotros estamos, estamos pidiendo, al, por favor, a las personas que regulan y que estudian los componentes del agua potable, que por favor se den cuenta que nosotros tuvimos una noticia emanada de la Junta de Agua donde nos comunican que tenemos un alto grado de, de pipa, o sea que es un contaminante muy peligroso. Entonces queremos que se le avise a la población el peligro que estamos viviendo de consumir esa agua potable con, contaminada. Entonces le, le pedimos que por favor, además de, comuniquen, de que le comuniquen a la población lo que está sucediendo con el agua potable, que tomen acciones para evitar, junto con EPA, que estoy escuchando, que están haciendo un buen trabajo, entonces puedan eliminar ese contaminante de nuestra agua potable. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Aramedli. Uh, Emanuela Soto with CWC. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Emmanuel Soto. I, I am here as a representative uh, from the city council for the city of Isaiah. I also work at Self Help Enterprises and I represent uh, disadvantaged communities in Tulare County uh, and help them manage their water construction projects, but also advocate for their needs. Uh, I want to piggyback off what Eric said here. I won't repeat everything he said, but I just want to emphasize that we make sure that the organizations and industries that are responsible for the PFAS are held responsible and, and, and made to, uh, to pay for anything uh, that, that needs to be done to eliminate PFAS from our water. Uh, and then also want to make sure that we uh, emphasize uh, a lot of this work on our disadvantaged communities. Uh, I know that PFAS is found in the water here in the city of Isaiah, and I, if it's here, I'm sure it's all around us. So uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, pretty much, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Soto. I don't know. We have uh, Esteban Curiel. Sí, buenas tardes. Este, mi nombre es Esteban Curiel. Yo vengo de la comunidad de, de Goodville también. Y aquí la cosa es de que yo estoy sorprendido porque es mi primera vez que escucho de ese, de ese contaminante PIFAS y... Sí, estoy preocupado porque en realidad no sé si la agua que, que hay en mi pueblo está contaminada de eso también y también que, que nos revisen a todos los pueblitos que, que, que estamos alrededor porque es algo muy peligroso y pues como dicen nos van a matar a nuestras familias y pues gracias si nos pueden echar una mano en eso. Thank you, Mr. Curio. I believe this was the, uh, that was the last individual that had signed up to speak. I'm gonna turn it over to Grace with LRG to share more about how you can provide feedback. All right, next slide, please. Since we have um, more time left in this listening session today, um, we can open it up to other speakers. Um, so if you would like to give feedback, please click the raise hand button in the Zoom navigation bar. Uh, please keep your hand raised until you've had an opportunity to give your feedback. Unmute when your name or number is called. You may share your webcam video if you'd like. Um, if you are joining via phone, callers should press star nine on the phone to share a comment. Please unmute and begin speaking when you hear your telephone number called. So we'll give, um, see if we have anyone, any hands that go up. Um, again, you um, can give comment if you raise your hand. I'll turn it back over to um, Karine 
our moderator, um, and we'll see if anyone else would like to speak. I will give it maybe a few more moments to see if anybody else would like to speak. Um, I believe there is a Lyle. Lyle? Lyle, we can't hear you, so uh, you might have to unmute. Uh, this is a question for the uh, EPA, and I was wondering whether or not you've done any research or uh, to identify the specific pesticides and fertilizers used with agricultural lands that have PPA, PFS. Yes, it is. Thank you. I, I <laughs> Sorry, Karina, I wasn't sure if we we're going to if we had an answer, if we had a very direct way of getting back to Lyle to respond to him. Yeah, uh, um, perhaps we can get Lyle's email or that would probably be a good Lyle if you could drop um, kind of your email address so that we can contact and follow up with you for your specific question. How would you like to email info at P PFAS community engagement? I think that would work. Okay. Uh, was there somebody else? Hey, um, Arnie, Le, I don't know if I'm pronouncing right. Arnie Lerici? Uh, Lerici, can you hear me? I can. Okay. I worked for EPA for 38 years, uh, Region 1, and then I moved to a site in Michigan that had a closed Air Force base. And the issue that I'd like to raise, I hope is being considered seriously in the hazardous waste designation, I mean, yeah, the hazardous waste designation of P4 and PFOS uh, in the change in the statutes to, uh, to make that happen. And the issue is that federal facilities are dealt with under CERCLA in a very different way than commercial or private polluters. And that different way is useful and necessary in many respects. However, in one respect, it is not. And that is how the state environmental agencies are held down very significantly by many, not all, but many federal facilities, especially in the Department of Defense. Every site or most sites are treated very differently. And many are good and they're honest in how those uh, sites are being treated, but a, a significant number of them are not treated well. The communities are not treated as well as they should be and the environmental agencies are not respected in many ways and their regulations until the very end of the CERCLA process. And it is almost too late to capture and fill the data gaps at that point. And 
I'd like to highlight where there was a pilot in California, in Region 9, and the Department of Defense Air Force, where they helped the states review, the state of California review all of their uh, uh, circular like regulations and, and uh, contamination regulations and help them up front in 2014 to meet whatever federal standards uh, or wording and legalities were corrected. So there was no stumbling blocks when that time to get the ARAS, uh, the applicable uh, requirements locked in. So I'd like to throw out there and I hope that the hazardous waste designation changes in that regulation include a more proactive way of federal facilities dealing with and working with the communities and the state environmental agencies and their regulations in the future. I started a RAB in 2016, applied the Air Force to do, to establish one, and I was the first co-chair in that RAB. So I was very disappointed in how little respect there was and priority that that site was given in Michigan. It's Worthsmith Air Force Base. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. L Mr. Lurich. Let's see, uh, Tobias Osborne. I see you have your hand up. Yeah, hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, thank you for uh, taking my comments. Um, I am a CSUMB, uh, California State University Monterey Bay student here in the Monterey Bay, one of the biggest um, marine wildlife for, uh, protected areas in the world. And every day I commute to school and I drive over the Salinas River. Um, and the Salinas Valley is one of the largest um, areas of agriculture in the US that produces you know, a large quantity of um, food to not only the US, but you know, the globe. And, and I know every time I drive over the Salinas River, I'm driving over one of the most contaminated rivers in the world. <laughs> and it just like, it drives me crazy that I'm a student and I know these things and that people in government aren't making fast enough um, decisions to stop this, you know, and not only affecting the human race, but all the species on the planet. And it's just, as a young person, it is extremely um, irritating and uh, makes me upset that, you know, I have to be standing up and taking a leadership role when I should be just learning about these sort of things. Um, so not trying to diss anybody's job or that it's any one person's fault, just that I think we need to take faster action. Um, and uh, I hope that this little comment motivates somebody in some sort of way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Um, Thank you for sharing your concerns with us. We, we will take that back. Um, let's see. I do not I do not believe there are any more hands raised at this time. Great. Well, thank you all for sharing your feedback with us tonight. Um, before we close, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague Matt Small to share a few of the major themes that we heard from you this evening. Matt? <clears throat> Can you hear me again? Yes. Thank you, Corrine. Uh, and more, most importantly, thank you all for sharing your feedback with us this evening. First of all, I appreciate the fact that we heard speakers from both Arizona and California 
and that we had individuals registered to attend tonight's session from all four of our Region 9 states and from the Pacific Islands and from tribal nations in Region 9. We heard appreciation for our efforts under the PFAS Strategic Roadmap and the importance of ensuring science-based decision-making, holding polluters accountable, ensuring cleanup at federal facilities and taking action even more quickly. We heard about the profound impacts that PFAS contamination has had on several communities here in Region 9, how PFAS has personally impacted your families and how challenging it can be to inform communities about PFAS contamination and for communities to treat them. We heard specifically about the challenges of PFAS in drinking water, including the importance of making testing available, impacts to children and families, and the unique impacts on small communities and communities served by private wells. We heard recommendations about addressing PFAS as a class of chemicals rather than one at a time, and about addressing PFAS in areas beyond drinking water, including in rivers and streams and wildlife. We heard about PFAS impacts on disadvantaged communities, in agricultural communities, and in communities with environmental justice concerns, and how PFAS can add further burden to communities already impacted by pollution. Thank you all again, and I'll turn it back over to Corrine to close us out tonight. Thank you, Matt. Following today's session, I wanted to highlight that you may continue to share input after today's event via email at pfascouncil at epa.gov. And again, that's pfascouncil at epa.gov. As we noted earlier, the feedback you share with us orally or via an email will not be considered as part of the formal comment process for any specific action that EPA is taking under the PFAS strategic roadmap. You can find more information on EPA's efforts on PFAS at EPA's website at www.epa.gov slash PFAS. On that site, you can find links to each of the major actions that EPA is undertaking under the PFAS roadmap and where appropriate links to the formal comment opportunities for each EPA action throughout the online docket. While we do not plan to individually respond to the comments we received this evening, we do plan to synthesize what we've learned from each of our regional sessions, as well as from our April 6th session uh, with tribes to inform EPA's future work on PFAS. Before I close, I want to turn it over to Martha, who would very much like to say a few words before we close. Thank you, Kareen. Um, I want to thank all of you again for your participation. Muchas gracias por los que tomaron el tiempo para participar y compartir uh, de todo lo que están encontrando en sus comunidades. And I very much look forward to the follow-up that we'll have with many of you. And I thank you. I have I have actually learned again from this conversation everything from circle pesticides to uh, the bread and butter of making sure communities know what's in their water and what's in their bodies. So thank you again, and I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you, Martha. With that, again, we would all like to thank you for joining us this evening, and a special thanks to each of you who shared feedback with us today. I personally would like to thank Regional Administrator Martha Guzman, Jeff Dawson from our EPA's PFAS Council, and my Region 9 colleague, Matt Small, for joining us as well. Thank you all again, and have a good night.